Dr. Lepresti is a psychologist in private practice, and he's also a senior researcher, and he comes to us all the way from Murdoch University in Western Australia. He's had almost 20 years of experience working with children through adults with a whole range of different mental health conditions, including depressive and anxiety-related disorders. He's published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals. He's talked about uh, and investigated the changes in diet affecting mental health, nutraceuticals, sleep, exercise, uh, the list goes on and on. He has recently completed some clinical trials investigating the antidepressant effects of curcumin and also the herb saffron in people who are suffering with major depressive disorder. He is a strong advocate of psychological, nutritional, and lifestyle-based interventions to enhance mental health, and he continues to conduct research in this area. I think you're in for a treat tonight, and I would like to introduce to you Dr. Adrian Lepresti. Welcome, Dr. Lepresti. Good evening. How is everyone? And you, you sound wonderful, and you're from halfway around the world. Where are you right now? Yes, I'm in Perth, Western Australia, so a fair <laughs> distance away from you guys. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us from so far away, and we look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, certainly yeah, I wanted to today cover um, the concept or the the area of inflammation and, and mental health because that's a, an area that's been receiving a lot of interest over the last uh, decade in particular, and uh, just want to really just go through some of the research linking inflammation and mental health, um, how it might affect mood and uh, and some of the causes of inflammation, where the infl inflammation may be coming from, and then finally go into some, some solutions on how we can uh, reduce inflammation and then in, in turn improve mood. So um, we'll be going through these slides and uh, if anybody has any questions, certainly uh, just um, pop them up. So if we think about uh, current treatments for mental health problems, uh, there are usually, well, there's primarily two that are most commonly used. The first is pharmaceutical medications, <clears throat> and these can include antidepressants, uh, which include uh, SSRIs, which uh, uh, increase serotonin levels are the, the primary ones that are used. There's, there's another class of medications called mood stabilizers. Uh, there are antipsychotics uh, that can be used, particularly with people with, uh, with, uh, I suppose, psychosis-related symptoms and and bipolar disorders often used. And there's also a class of medications uh, which, uh, I suppose, are, are aimed at kind of reducing kind of stress and anxiety. Um, then, from a psychological standpoint, the uh, other options that are available are. And the, the primary one, I suppose, that's been used most in, in most research is cognitive behaviour therapy. And the, the goal of cognitive behaviour therapy is, is really to look at changing our thoughts. Um, and if we can change our thoughts to, I suppose, become more realistic or rational, then uh, that in turn then improves mood. And then more recently, there's lots of interest in um, therapies referred as mindfulness-based therapies. Uh, and mindfulness is, I suppose, a form of meditation where... Uh, it's looking at trying to help people to become more present um, and when we're present we can kind of deal with the reality of the situation rather than the thoughts and, and uh, images that are occurring in our head. So they're the, probably the, the primary uh, two forms of, um, of tr treatments that are available at the moment. In terms of their effectiveness, um, medications and psychological therapy are equally effective. So um, medications probably work a little bit quicker than psychological therapies, but overall they're, they're pretty similar in their, in their effectiveness. So generally the studies kind of confirm that about 30% fully recover, 30% partially recover. This is more in relation to kind of depression. But 40% get no better, which is of concern. So, and basically, we have really have kind of 70% of people who are either partially recovered or, have, or feel no better from uh, from uh, from these treatments. If you combine the two together, they generally kind of work a bit better. Um, the problem with medications is that there's several adverse effects: so weight gain, nausea, headaches, increased appetite. Many people kind of report that they have no feeling; they kind of the mood is just flat, so they don't feel high or low and reduced energy. So they're common complaints associated with kind of medications. And I think that the, the, the most concerning is that they really don't treat the underlying cause. So while they may modify kind of neurotransmitters, which are brain chemicals, which I'll go through later, 
um, they do not really kind of target what might be causing some of the imbalances that might be occurring in somebody. So this is what led to kind of uh, research in the area of inflammation. So let me just go through a bit of background about what inflammation is. Um, I mean, inflammation is absolutely necessary and essential for all of living, um, and it's our, it's our body's response to injury and infection. It protects us from pathogens like bacteria, like viruses or fungi. Um, it, they, it protects us from external injuries like scrapes or foreign objects. And, uh, and also the effects of chemicals and radiation, just to name a few. So absolutely essential. If we didn't have an inflammatory response, we wouldn't be able to fight disease. Um, and there's five signs, I suppose, of acute inflammation. So there's redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. And all these kind of response uh, uh, symptoms, I suppose, or signs are uh, indications of kind of the body going into defensive mode, looking at trying to heal the body and protect the body from whatever um, in, uh, cause might be impacting on the, on the inflammation. So acute inflammation, absolutely essential and required for life. So it's not a bad thing. The problem is when it becomes chronic. And for many people, there is chronic inflammation, which is an, an unhealthy inflammatory over-response that can link for months or years. Um, and it, it, it may or may not be uh, occurring in, with acute inflammation, so you may, may or may not have the redness, the swelling, the loss of function and so forth and the pain. So often many people don't even know that they're inflamed. Uh, there's no necessarily kind of sign or symptoms that they're experiencing chronic inflammation. And the way that we've, we've kind of looked at um, inflammation from a mental health standpoint is really look at some of the blood markers and urinary markers um, so several markers in our blood can can rise uh, when we're in, uh, when we're inflamed, and uh, and that's where the studies kind of looked at uh, measuring these markers in blood. And basically, uh, the research has confirmed that inflammation is is generally increased in people with uh, mental health problems, particularly in the area of depression. So lots of uh, uh, so inflammation has received a lot of media attention um, over uh, over time, and uh, and the problem with inflammation is that chronic inflammation can actually damage most organs in the body, including the brain. So the brain is certainly not susceptible, not protective against inflammation, and that's where it may impact on inf um, mental health from that standpoint. So the research confirms that uh, in the era of depression, for example, that people with depression overall, if you compare people with depression against uh, healthy samples, that people with depression have increased levels of inflammation as measured by blood markers. Having higher inflammation also increases the risk of suffering from depression. So if you have inflammation, if we measure your, your uh, say for example, your C-reactive protein, which is a marker of uh, inflammation in the blood, um, and it's high and you don't suffer from depression at the moment, you're at greater risk of suffering from depression in the next five years. So having inflammation is a certainly a risk factor for suffering from um, a mental health disorder. Uh, the, issue, the research has also shown that having inflammation decreases the success of traditional treatments for depression. So if you have high levels of inflammation, your effectiveness, um, your, the ability of kind of pharmaceutical medications and cognitive behaviour therapy decrease, so they don't just they don't work as well. So we really need to kind of target that, uh, the causes of, of inflammation. If uh, you are successfully treated um, for, with you, uh, from your depression, then inflammation usually reduces, which is a, a positive sign, so indicating that there may, that the inflammation must be playing a role in our in our mood. Um, some of the uh, research is also showing that over time, pharmaceutical antidepressants can also have an anti-inflammatory effect. So it may be uh, the issue with kind of pharmaceutical medications is that it increases kind of serotonin. It may increase, for example, with serotonin in our brain or serotonin availability in our brain, and that works pretty immediate. So within the next day or so after you take a, an antidepressant, your serotonin levels are high, but your mood's not necessarily improved. Um, and so the theory is that maybe it takes longer. Uh, the reason why it takes so long for antidepressants to work is that it might, the mood lifting effect might be via its anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and what an interesting um, a few, a couple of interesting studies that occurred uh, uh, probably about 10 years ago was that um, this is what led me to look at the area of uh, inflammation and mental health was that they use anti-inflammatory drugs to improve mood. So. There was one study where, or a couple of studies where they had people on antidepressants um, 
and they gave them an antidepressant plus an, a pharmaceutical anti-inflammatory, and they did far better than people who were just on the antidepressant on their own. So it seemed like the combination of the two had a really positive mood lifting effect. The problem is, you, you know, there's, there's several side effects associated with anti-inflammatory drugs, um, particularly over the longer term. So we really want to look at kind of natural forms of uh, or natural ways to reduce inflammation. Um, so most of the research has been in, in the area of depression with regards to inflammation, but uh, inflammation is also seen in several um, anxiety-related disorders. So there's been inflammation found in people with panic disorder, agoraphobia, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, inflammation is found in people with bipolar disorder, which is basically the highs and people who experience highs and lows. And also uh, inflammation has been found in people with schizophrenia and ADHD, interestingly, too. So, And that's what's um, led me to kind of do some research in the area of ADHD, which I'll talk about later. And the other area, I suppose, is autism. Certainly a lot of kids with autism um, have higher levels of inflammation. So how does inflammation affect mood? Um, well, one of the things that it does is that it actually influences our mood lifting neurotransmitters. So for, for those of you who don't know, neurotransmitters are brain chemicals or chemicals in our brain that help transmit information. And uh, a couple of that have been um, primarily kind of linked to mood, uh, one's called serotonin and dopamine. So uh, the theory there is that if serotonin is low or dopamine is low, then our mood uh, will be adversely effective, affected. And what the research shows is that inflammation actually reduces serotonin. So uh, now lowered serotonin can impact on kind of mood, sadness, and lower serotonin is also associated with sleep problems and appetite problems. So rather than the traditional treatment where uh, pharmaceutical antidepre antidepressants increase serotonin, it doesn't, as I said earlier, it doesn't necessarily treat the cause. And maybe one of the causes is inflammation. So people might actually be low in serotonin because of inflammation going on in their body, which then kind of um, impacts on the production and breakdown of serotonin. And, uh, and inflammation also reduces dopamine levels. And dopamine uh, is our neurotransmitter, which is associated with pleasure, drive, and also attention. So it could be that the reduced um, uh, the inflammation is having a negative effect on dopamine, and by theoretically uh, decreasing this inflammation, we might be able to have a positive effect on these neurotransmitters. Inflammation also uh, seems to affect our natural biological stress response. So we have a fight or flight response, um, which is absolutely adaptive and, and appropriate when there is danger. Um, but the problem is that for many people with mental health problems, their stress response is either too sensitive, it gets turned on too quickly, um, or its response is, is uh, too elevated. Um, or for some people, uh, their stress response is not active enough, so it's what we call hyperactive. Um, and what the research shows is that inflammation can actually have an impact on this stress response. It can increase levels of stress hormones in our body, in particular cortisol. Uh, so it could be that the increase, the inflammation that starts, then elevates cortisol levels, and then that, and then the cortisol levels then makes us kind of a heart rate. Um, faster, our breathing rate faster, we feel tense, our mind's racing, and, and so forth. So it could be that inflammation is having an, um, an impact through our, our modifying our stress response. Inflammation also seems to kind of turn on brain structures that, that alert us to danger. So it, it has an impact on um, kind of turning on a, a particular area of the brain, known as, known as the amygdala, and, uh, and, and that area of the brain is associated with fear. So it could be that inflammation is kind of having a, a, a turning on that particular area and then that makes us more kind of aware of fear and danger in our environment and that's where particularly around kind of the anxiety uh, it might be having a negative impact. Over time inflammation also uh, is you know, inflammatory, inflammatory hormones are toxic to the brain so actually it can lead to deterioration in several areas of the brain. So it is, uh, as I said earlier, inflammation can affect all organs, including the brain. And uh, inflammation also increases concentrations of damaging free radicals. So we have, uh, and so free radicals are normally produced in our body, which is fine, but when there's extra inflammation, too many free radicals are being produced, and, and, and the research kind of confirms that 
free radicals can damage again all parts of our, our, all our organs, including the brain again. So I'm kind of giving a really bad uh, vibe about inflammation, but certainly it can be uh, damaging. Um, and the other thing too is that inflammation also impairs thyroid hormone output. So while everybody's being kind of placed on um, on thyroid hormones when uh, they have kind of thyroid problems, it may be again that uh, we're not treating the cause; we're just kind of treating via uh, um, thyroid medication. But uh, um, but maybe we need to kind of target the inflammation. So the inflammation can affect our thyroid, which affects our energy. Inflammation can have a damaging effect on on our sex hormones. Um, and then as a result, our sex drive, our fertility and our hormonal cycles are kind of changed. And we know that thyroid hormones and sex hormones can affect our mood. And inflammation can also contribute to insulin resistance. So it affects our blood sugars and then that affects our weight and then various variations in our blood sugars can affect our energy, our drive and our mood again. And finally, inflammation can also impact on hunger and society-related hormones. So things like leptin and ghrelin, that uh, are two hormones that are associated with uh, with hunger. And uh, and inflammation seems to have a negative effect on on in in that area too. So that's where some of the um, appetite changes that occur in depression, for example, um, may be related to um, inflammation that's going on in the body. So I suppose this is where, which just really has kind of led to the interest um, from researchers to continue to kind of examine the impact of inflammation. We know that it can affect all these different uh, biological pathways, and many of these biological pathways that I've mentioned are disturbed in people with mental health problems. And so uh, neurotransmitters, the stress response, uh, hormone output, uh, sex hormones, insulin resistance, they're all kind of disturbed in uh, in people uh, with mental health disorders. So so we know that inflammation is high uh, in people with depression and other mental health conditions, but where does this inflammation kind of come from? And, uh, and that's which has uh, really kind of steered the next area of kind of interest that uh, researchers are looking at. So the the first thing is really an unhealthy diet. So um, an unhealthy diet can be uh, very inflammatory. So increased intake of processed foods, takeaway, high sugar foods, additives, soft drinks, excess alcohol, uh, they can all be very inflammatory. Um, and so that's where it might be one area um, that we need to look at. So when we're looking at kind of decreasing inflammation, diet is an area that we need to kind of consider. Uh, we know that fruit, vegetables, healthy fats, lean protein, fibre, spices, herbs, they're all very anti-inflammatory um, and they're often kind of reduced when we're not feeling so good. We move towards the kind of processed sugary foods um, and while that might kind of make us feel a little bit better for a short period, it contributes to inflammation that's going on in our body which then damages um, you know, all our hormones and so forth. So it's so one area is the unhealthy diet. Uh, we know that also reduced physical activity. Um, sorry, let's go back. Um, also, is uh, an has an impact on inflammation. So, interestingly, exercise initially is quite inflammatory, but over time, when you continue to exercise ongoingly, it actually is is anti-inflammatory. So, um, we know that uh, over the years, people are, are engaging in far less physical activity, um, and it may be through through that mechanism uh, that inflammation is occurring for people. And if you want to inflame the body, don't sleep. Um, I mean, that's uh, a really big issue. So problems staying asleep, falling asleep, sleep apnea is also very inflammatory. So, uh, so this is kind of a, a common area for many people. Um, so for many people, people with depression, for example, or anxiety, they might have problems falling asleep. Um, and for others too, it's actually the sleep problems that occur before the depression. So it could be that, that sleep problems begin uh, or people don't really pay enough attention to the quality of their sleep. That's contributing to inflammation and then over time it kind of then triggers a depressive episode. Uh, stress is probably the one of the most common kind of predictable triggers of, uh, of depression and other mood related problems. And we know that prolonged stress is again uh, very inflammatory. So the stress can come from work, education, finances, relationships, parenting. It could come from absolutely anything. It doesn't really matter uh, where, the, where the cause of the stress is coming from, but we know if our body's under constant stress, 
through uh, things that are occurring in our life or even imaginary stress. You know, it might be that with predicting bad things happening. That can also be um, very inflammatory too. We're bombarded with environmental toxins, uh, the things in our food, um, our cleaning material, plastics, pollution, and they're all very inflammatory too. So uh, certainly we're being uh, bombarded with far more environmental toxins than we've ever had. And it could be that this is, might be contributing some, to some of the increased inflammation that we're seeing um, in people. Interestingly, also some medications can be uh, can be a problem, um, and in particular things like, let's say, for example, while um, and, uh, you know, antidepressants, well, well, some some medications, for example, uh, can, let's like, say, for antibiotics, can while they they can uh, help fight disease, they can also damage the lining of the gut. They can affect our probiotic levels in our gut. Um, and then that uh, imbalance in our gut then can also contribute to inflammation that's going on for us. So we also need to consider some of the medications that, are, uh, that we're taking too. And food intolerances. So interestingly, uh, many people actually uh, suffer from either uh, kind of diagnosed food allergies, such as just people with celiac disease, but there are also many people who are eating foods that are just intolerant to you. You may not necessarily fit the criteria for a food allergy, but it's just caused that bloating, it causes kind of uh, digestive kind of pain and things like that. And the, the main culprits are kind of gluten, dairy, eggs, nuts and seafood. Um, they actually can cause uh, intolerances for people and that could be a big contributor to inflammation for people. So the issue with regards to food is that um, one man's meat is another man's poison. So what might be really healthy for one individual might uh, not be so for another. So we need to consider whether food intolerances could be an issue for people. Our coping skills. Uh, if you want to, if you want to increase inflammation in your body, just continue to worry and ruminate, and uh, continue to focus on the problems. Uh, spend all day thinking about how you can solve a problem that may not be solvable, and I guarantee that your uh, markers in your blood associated with inflammation will increase. So we know that uh, worry and pe people who worry and ruminate and obsess over things. And that can be uh, very inflammatory. And interestingly, uh, social support, uh, having good social support is actually anti-inflammatory. So we know that um, it seems as though having good social support and having good kind of um, using people for uh, support, whether it be practical or emotional, uh, can have a positive effect. And the problem these days is that we're becoming more and more isolated and then that can then contribute to some of the inflammation that's going on. Food, alcohol and other drugs uh, is again uh, you know, related to what I said earlier around the kind of the food side of things but many people can use the food, alcohol and drugs as a coping skill um, and uh, while that might kind of numb some of the feelings initially we know that they can be uh, very inflammatory. And, um, and finally, you know, having any medical condition, many, most of our medical conditions are associated with inflammation. So having an autoimmune condition, cardiovascular disease is very inflammatory, uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity. And we know that fat cells are very inflammatory too. So we're having too much kind of body fat can also increase inflammation and uh, chronic pain and, and particularly digestive problems. That's one of the biggest issues, I think. There's a, a lot of research showing a link between the gut and the brain. And that um, while and that people with kind of um, an unhealthy digestive um, system uh, can, it can cause inflammation and also then lead to kind of mood problems. And finally, our genetics. So some people just have genes that uh, make them far more susceptible to producing kind of inflammatory uh, um, markers. So saying all this, what's the solution to uh, to reduce um, inflammation? And I suppose what I really want to highlight is my approach is very multifaceted. There's not ever going to be one solution to over to to um, to reduce kind of mental health problems and to treat somebody's mental health problems. So so I really want people to think about uh, the individual causes, what things might be causing inflammation for them, and it may not be relevant for somebody else, but it may be relevant to them. And then how do they kind of make changes in 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 these areas? So the first thing is is to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and generally kind of the research shows that things like a Mediterranean based diet, fish, nuts, natural foods, vegetables, lots of herbs and spices, berries, healthy fats, 
they're all very uh, anti-inflammatory. So if we can, people can start eating more of those types of foods uh, in their diet, uh, we know that, that the inflammation can, can reduce significantly. Also eating regularly to balance blood sugars. So often people spend, uh, you might miss breakfast and not eat again till, or not eat till lunchtime and we're going almost, you know, almost 12 hours without food. And having uh, unregulated, I suppose, or unbalanced blood sugars can, uh, can contribute to inflammation. So we really encourage people to, to eat, you know, five meals a day really is, is, is the ideal and generally kind of a combination of protein, fat and, and, uh, and carbohydrate or, um, in their meals so they can uh, um, manage the blood sugar levels. Uh, avoid allergenic foods. Um, this is, can be quite complex. It's really trying to uh, helping people try and identify what food might be causing inflammation for them, and this may be a, a, a comprised kind of some a trial and an elimination of certain foods, and then kind of uh, avoiding it for a couple of weeks, and then reintroducing it and seeing whether that has a positive impact on on their mood and on uh, any other symptoms they, they might be experiencing. Increase exercise and physical activity. So uh, if somebody's not exercising, or if also, I suppose the other thing I need to point out is if they're exercising too much, that can also be, so it's all about balance with regards to exercise. Too little's not, not great, too much is also not great. So it, uh, inf uh, physical activity and exercise reduces inflammation by lowering inflammation, inflammatory hormones and also body fat. Also what exercise does is that, um, I said earlier how ruminating, obsessing about our problems um, can also be very inflammatory. So what exercise does is it moves your focus away from your problems and helps you kind of at least for a period concentrate on what you're doing. Um, it might be walking, running, going to the gym. It might be walking and talking to somebody at the same time. So at least you're moving your focus away from the problems in your life and you're at least now being far more present, concentrating on the exercise. Uh, exercise is comparable to physical, uh, to psychological therapy and antidepressants. Uh, so we really need to remember that. In terms of the types of exercise, duration, intensity, and format, we really don't know yet. So really, the the, the recommendation is to uh, engage in regular exercise and the one that you enjoy. It doesn't really matter uh, uh, which one you need to choose at the moment. And generally, with regards to exercise, it's it's more um, while going for a run today might be, make me feel better today. Um, it's more uh, engaging in an exercise program for at least 10 weeks. That seems to have more the durable effects uh, on mood. If you um, want to improve mood, you need to make sure your sleep patterns are good. And I know this can be difficult for many people, um, but really it's about trying to develop a really good sleep hygiene. Um, going to bed at the same time, avoiding coffee, um, not eating uh, uh, too much before you go to bed, having a comfortable bed, bedroom environment and things like that. Um, there's plenty of information on the internet and, and, and good, great books on, on sleep that I, if you're suffering from sleep, I really encourage you to dedicate some energy to, um, to improve your sleep patterns. There's also several um, natural nutrients that can um, help promote sleep and I've listed some of them there which have, uh, these are the ones that have, I suppose, the most research based uh, around um, improving, uh, um, improving sleep. And also learn to relax. Um, so if we can kind of um, learn relaxation techniques, it can be slow diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, meditation. I think that's a really important skill to learn. When it comes to relaxation, it is a skill, and so therefore it takes practice. And I encourage a lot of my clients to uh, to just dedicate a few weeks of practicing relaxation, trying different ones, and seeing which one works for them, um, and really not to to look for any kind of benefits initially. It may be more longer term as I really learn the skill of relaxation. Reduce stress levels. I know this is easier said than done for many people, but where possible, you know, it's really important for people to look at their life and, and consider ways that they can minimize unnecessary or avoidable stresses. Um, again, learning relaxation is extremely important. I also ask people to avoid as much as possible toxic or, or energy draining individuals. Uh, I think that um, uh, if possible, uh, you know, re people really need to consider that, particularly when their mental health is suffering. Uh, I think we feed off other people and if they're very uh, negative and toxic and, and 
um, and create stress in ourselves and that can have a damaging effect on us. So we need to kind of avoid those people and I and really try to be around people who are far more positive and, uh, and so forth. I know easier said than done for a lot of people um, but it's about really minimising uh, uh, exposure there. And where possible, um, you know, certainly psychological therapy such as cognitive behaviour therapy um, may be warranted for people. So while psychological therapy, the theory there is that it affects the way that we think, some of the research is actually showing that psychological therapy is actually also very anti-inflammatory. So it may be via its kind of change in thoughts and then also then it has a really positive impact on our physiology. And I also ask people to engage in soothing activities, whatever that might be. And I ask people to think about your, your senses, you know, our, our sight, our, our, our hearing, our touch, our taste, you know, and, and using all those senses going, okay, what things um, can you look at that make you feel good? What things can you listen to that make you feel good, that help soothe you? Um, what things can you smell? So, you know, a lot of people use the aromatherapies and, and things like that. So, so really considering some of the things that kind of are soothing for them. And then again, there's also kind of your natural stress relieving supplements. And the ones I've listed there are theanine, rhodiola, romania, ashwagandha and, uh, and saffron. And I'll go through some of these later. Improved coping skills. So seek support from loved ones um, by asking for help. Absolutely important. So we know that um, support uh, for us can be really important and uh, if we can kind of ask support from a practical point of view or even from an emotional point of view that's going to be really important for many people. Again learning relaxation keeps coming up, learn CBT and mindfulness, mindfulness exercises through uh, seeing a, a counsellor or psychologist or even there's plenty of online programs out there too or self-help books that can help. And also engage in pleasurable activities. So, you know, what makes you feel good? Uh, what helps you move your focus away from your problems towards something else? So yes, I know your problems don't go away, but at least for an hour or two, you're, you're focused on the activity that's making you feel good. That then has an anti-inflammatory effect on your body, soothing, calming effect on your body, and then that might really have a positive impact on mood. And then again, minimising unnecessary or avoidable stresses. The other thing is then you know, treat medical conditions. So our gut function is absolutely crucial. So I really encourage people, you know, particularly if they have any digestive problems, but even um, even if they don't, you know, uh, you know, what foods you're eating, uh, how often you're eating, chew your food, those types of things are really important. Uh, but if you're suffering from digestive problems, I encourage you to uh, to really try to heal your gut through um, through dietary changes through reduction of stress, because stress can also uh, impact in our gut function, and also through the use of certain herbs and, 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 um, and natural nutrients can be really healing uh, for the gut. Uh, reduce pain and inflammation associated with medical conditions, so that might be through uh, taking some supplements, learning relaxation, um, engaging in some kind of physical rehabilitation through, uh, through exercise or um, and, and through some interventions through a physiotherapist or exercise physiologist or osteopath or whatever um, um, might help from that point of view. And here, just really engage in healthy lifestyle practices. You know, they're really, you know, often we think about medical conditions being treated through medical treatments, but, uh, but the reality is that our lifestyle can have a significant impact on, on, our, um, on our medical on our physical health and even things like cardiovascular disease where often statins are used to treat them. I mean stress is one of the main kind of contributors to, to heart disease so if we can improve our, our management of stress then we can also have a, a positive impact on, on a cardiovascular disease. And also just reduce uh, again kind of I mentioned earlier some medications can have an impact so, and medications can also reduce some of the um, vitamins and minerals in our body that are essential for reducing some of the hormones. So. I'm not saying go off medications, but where necessary, where, where appropriate, really kind of reduce unnecessary medications and always in consult, consultation with a medical uh, practitioner. Uh, finally, the last one I, I think is really important is to enhance spiritual health. And whatever that might be for somebody, that may be a, a, a religion for, for an individual, um, but ultimately I think it's about having a life purpose. Um, you know, what are you here for? It doesn't mean that you need to be here to save the world, um, but it's, it's where's your role, what's your purpose, how can you make a difference to, uh, to yourself and to others in your life? 
and, uh, and I think that's really important for people to, uh, to look at their values and look at um, engaging in behaviours that kind of fit with their values. Um, and also about increasing connection to others, I think that's really important from a spiritual point of view and to the environment. So from a um, supplements point of view, um, just mindful time, um, some of the important ones I think really uh, can be really useful are B vitamins. Um, B vitamins are really crucial for the production of neurotransmitters such as serotonin. And they also can have, uh, some of the research shows that they also can have an anti-inflammatory effect. So I think uh, it's really important for people to uh, take a, a good quality B complex um, on a daily basis. Fish oils, there's lots of research around fish oils um, and, uh, and I think uh, fish oils are extremely important for brain health. Um, they're potent anti-inflammatories and they also, what they do is actually make the cells in our brains more sensitive to neurotransmitters. So while they don't necessarily increase kind of serotonin levels in our brain, they, it just makes kind of the serotonin that we have in our brain more um, available. And generally kind of the research shows that the fish oils with higher levels of EPA are the, uh, the ones we, in fish oil we have DHA and EPA. It's generally the kind of higher EPA fish oils that have a more positive effect. St. John's wort um, is effective for mild to moderate depression, so that's always an option for people. The, only, the, the main problem with, um, with St. John's wort is that it interacts with several medications. I've listed some of those there. So, so often, often um, for people on medications, it's often not a great option. Um, and probably St. John's wort is, I suppose, limited in terms of its anti-inflammatory effects. Saffron, uh, the spice, is actually uh, have some um, mood lifting effects, and uh, a lot of the research uh, is a lot of there's not a lot of publicity on saffron, which is quite surprising because there's now been at least ten high quality randomised double blind placebo controlled trials on saffron. Uh, three studies have shown that saffron is more effective than a placebo for the treatment of mild to moderate depression. Four studies compared saffron with antidepressant medication, and it was as effective in all of them and had less side effects than the antidepressants. Uh, saffron, uh, in one study showed that the saffron plus an antidepressant was better, better than the antidepressant and placebo alone, so it seems to make antidepressants work better. And interestingly, two studies have also shown that saffron improves symptoms of sexual dysfunction in men and women um, who were taking antidepressants. So antidepressants can cause sexual kind of related problems in, in, in people taking them. And if you took an antidepressant and had these kind of sexual related problems and you took saffron, it seemed to improve uh, many of those symptoms. And another one uh, which was recently published showed that one study was that um, saffron presented, uh, prevented uh, metabolic syndrome in people with schizophrenia. So these uh, people with schizophrenia were placed on a lansipine, which is an antipsychotic. And after six weeks, zero people on saffron and 27.3% on placebo developed metabolic syndrome, which is pretty impressive. Theanine is an amino acid that's found from teas, particularly green tea, and five studies have shown that theanine reduces stress and anxiety in healthy people. It increases alpha waves, and alpha waves are associated with kind of meditation and mood and focus, and it seems to kind of have a positive effect from that point of view. And it reduces several kind of markers associated with, um, with stress, including um, lowering our blood pressure and heart rate. So if, uh, uh, what they did was they kind of stressed people out and they measured their blood pressure and heart rate, which, is, which generally is elevated when we're stressed, but taking theanine before um, had a, kind of moderated that increase. Uh, two studies showed that theanine reduced anxiety in people with schizophrenia. One study also showed that, um, showed that it improved sleep in children with ADHD, so which is really positive too. Ashwagandha um, is a, another, I suppose, natural ingredient that has some um, positive effects. And several clinical studies now confirm that it has anti-anxiety and stress-relieving effects. It seems to lower cortisol, which is our stress hormone. Um, studies have also shown that it improves working memory in people with bipolar disorder. So often um, people on medications, their memory and concentrations obviously is often a adversely affected. And ashw ashwagandha seems to have a positive effect from that point of view. And then interestingly, it also um, seemed to restore thyroid hormone levels in people on bipolar medications. So many people who would take those medications, their thyroid hormones are adversely affected. But if you gave them ashwagandha, their, uh, their thyroid hormones weren't, weren't as impacted, which is really important. 
when it comes to any kind of herbs and spices and things that we use, the quality is important. And most studies have generally kind of used this KSM um, 66 version of, uh, of ashwagandha. But there are others out there, and I know there's new research coming out with other forms too. Rhodiola um, is a plant that's found in the cold regions of the world. At least six trials to show that rhodiola improved um, physical performance in healthy volunteers. At least four trials show that rhodiola improved mental performance. It's improved attention and problem solving. Uh, one study showed that rhodiola improved anxiety in people with generalised anxiety disorder. And one study has also shown that improved mood in people with depression. So a nice, um, a nice option for people with um, kind of mood-related problems. Uh, so it's very effective improving symptoms of what I kind of see as kind of stress-related fatigue, or many people will refer to as adrenal fatigue. So if you have symptoms of fatigue or exhaustion or um, non-refreshing sleep, so you wake up feeling unrefreshed, if you have sleep disturbances, if you feel overwhelmed or unable to cope, if you have a craving for salty or sweet foods, these are kind of all the symptoms associated with this adrenal fatigue uh, syndrome. Uh, sensitivity to light, low stamina and slow to recover, slow to recover from injury or illness, difficulty concentrating or brain fog, poor digestion. So if you have any of those types of symptoms or a collection of those types of symptoms, then uh, radiology can certainly be a very good option for you. Now when it comes to um, radiola, so generally people with long-term stress, uh, feelings of burnout or adrenal fatigue, uh, and again, quality is important. So it really needs to be standardised to contain kind of uh, the level of kind of rosevins as indicated on that slide. So, now this is my pet, is curcumin. Um, curcumin is a, the main kind of metabolite from turmeric and I'm doing a lot of research on the effects of curcumin uh, for the treatment of depression and also completing a trial at the moment for its effects on people, on kids with ADHD. Um, and I completed a trial uh, a, a few years ago which was really positive in terms of its effect on, on depre depression. So curcumin is a really powerful antioxidant and natural anti-inflammatory. Um, the problem with curcumin, however, is that it's poorly absorbed by, in the body. Um, so we kind of got a poor bioavailability. And so we really need to get a form that has a, a higher bioavailability because it's not absorbed so well in the body. Curcumin seems to kind of increase serotonin levels. It reduces inflammation. There's a powerful antioxidant. It protects the brain. It's one of my favourite um, I suppose uh, supplements that I personally take, and I think a lot of people are um, useful for you to take on an ongoing basis. Um, there's some positive research that maybe kind of re really has a positive effect on brain function and, and protect and is brain protective. Um, so anything, any conditions that can affect the brain, I think uh, curcumin is really uh, useful. Um, when it comes to curcumin, as I said, the problem is the bioavailability, and so my studies have used uh, a form of curcumin known as BCM95, which is a painted extract, um, and uh, and that's where most of the studies around the depression have been used. Uh, there's plenty of other um, curcumin forms out there, but it's the BCM95 that's been mainly used for um, for depression. Um, so several clinical studies have now been completed. It's more effective than a placebo. It lowers depression and actually uh, some of the research that I'm kind of showing is finding is that it actually has a positive effect on anxiety too. One study confirmed it was more effective than fluoxetine. And, uh, and in the study that I completed, um, it seemed to be quite effective with people called with the, what we call atypical depression. And these are pimped, uh, people with the following symptoms. They have kind of their mood lifts during positive events. Um, so even though they're depressed, their mood can lift. They have increased appetite or weight gain. They have an increased desire to sleep or have an unrefreshing sleep. They're quite sensitive to interpersonal interactions and they have this heavy laden feeling. Um, so if you have those types of symptoms, I think curcumin is a very good option for you. Other ones, just notes, which I won't go through in too much detail, vitamin D. Uh, so, you know, sunlight's a kind of mood, I think it's, you know, have a really positive effect on mood and affects uh, our neurotransmitters, so I think vitamin D is really important. And so I think sunlight, getting as much sunlight as possible within reason, knowing its impact on, in Australia, we have you know, a big problem with skin cancer, so uh, we need to kind of be careful around that. Um, and there's some positive stuff around kind of probiotics um, uh, coming out. Still early days yet, but probiotics seems to have a positive impact on the, on the gut and our bacteria in our gut can also affect a lot of our hormones and neurotransmitters. So 
um, I think probiotics is, uh, is really important too. Uh, it's crucial for the immune system um, and as I said, it, it, um, probiotics also has an anti-inflammatory effect too. And the other one which I think is really a nice mineral is magnesium. Um, it's really kind of associated with over 300 enzymes in our body. Um, so deficiency is, is often associated with anxiety. And some estimates are indicating that up to 80% of people are magnesium deficient. So I think that's uh, really important. It has this really nice calming properties. So I think kind of uh, magnesium, a good form of magnesium, because magnesium, uh, there's different forms out there, um, and some are quite poorly absorbed. So anywhere kind of between you know, two to 400 milligrams uh, twice a day seems to, to have a nice calming effect uh, from that point of view. So quickly running through all these slides, I'm, I'm mindful of time. So, um, so just in conclusion, really, I don't really, you know, I think that the, the problem we have is when we're trying to look at, find one solution to overcome our kind of mental health problems, one solution to reduce our, um, our inflammation. And the reality is that um, there isn't going to be one solution. It's a multifaceted approach. And I think that if people can make 10 changes, which each on their own might be absolutely insignificant, so eating more fruit and veggies may not necessarily improve your mood and overcome your depression, but it might improve your mood by 2%. So you, you, you mood, well, let's say five percent. So your moods improve by five percent by changing, increasing more fruit and veggies. You're exercising more. That's another five percent improvement. Uh, you're taking some supp supplements. Another five to ten percent improvement. And each of them collectively are extremely powerful. So my model is really to kind of look at, you know, eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Increase physical activity will help us feel a little bit better. Uh, improve our coping skills a little bit more. Improve our sleep. If we get an extra hour of sleep that um, um, will have a positive impact on our mood. Engage in pleasurable and soothing activities. If we can do that a little bit more, they'll have a positive, you know, another 5% you know, increase in our mood. We improve our physical and gut health. We reduce pain by 5-10%. We, we improve our gut function by 5-10%. Uh, we're going to feel even happier still. And we take mood lifting supplements and on their own, each of these are insignificant, but collectively they're the most powerful treatments that are available uh, uh, for any mental health condition. So that's um, um, done. So if anybody has questions, I'll... shall I pass on to? Well, thank you, thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Lapreste. I really greatly appreciated that. What a lot of important information. We do have some questions that are already queuing up. So uh, let me read a few to you and. Uh, first is, are there tests to see how much serotonin, dopamine, et cetera, is in your body? And secondly, um, are there tests to determine the level of inflammation in your body? Okay. So the inflammation, yes, there's some blood tests, the standard blood tests that you can get done. Um, the, the most common is what we call a C-reactive protein. So you can get that done by your doctor. Um, and there's a um, there's what we call kind of high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So that's a good general measure of of inflammation and one that everybody can get can get done. Um, and then there's other markers that are available, but that's probably the first one that I would look at. In terms of um, markers for serotonin and dopamine, there are some companies that are doing some um, measurements of of um, neurotransmitters uh, through urine. Uh, um, now I'm still not convinced yet that they're either that reliable, but but you know I'm happy to kind of look at the evidence there. But I mean, so there might be an option there for people. They're quite expensive though, but they might be an option for people, particularly if they're still struggling with their mood and they want to really kind of narrow down some causes. So that's, there is a possibility for for that. Right. The, the third part of the question was test for vitamin D and magnesium. So I know there's a vitamin yep. D test too. Do doctors test regularly for magnesium? Um, oh, they may do. They may, so certainly the vitamin D is simple and they, that can be done. Um, magnesium, there is blood tests, uh, serum magnesium that can be done. Um, I'm not... I'm not a huge fan of it. I think that uh, generally people with the magnesium... Um, uh, they already show low when it's really, really deficient, and our body has a way to kind of regulate the blood levels. So, if our blood level, if our levels are low, then it will just kind of pull magnesium from our tissues to maintain our, our magnesium. But absolutely worth worth getting done. Uh, you know, it's if you can if you can get them done. I don't not aware of the system in, in the US, but uh, we can get it done here in Australia for free. So, if it, uh, um, but 
in the US and probably costs you, so you just need to kind of be aware of the pros and cons of getting it done. But mm -hmm. there are ones available. So. Oh, excellent. Um, here's another question about children. Um, mm -hmm. When children have OCD, anxiety disorders, childhood depression, do you believe that that's also related to inflammation? And if so, is this a, is it as strongly correlated as in adults? Um, most of the research has been done in the area of adults, um, but there are some studies showing uh, inflammation in children. I'd say the answer is, is yes. It's just that adults are usually the area that kind of researchers look at first. But um, I think you, absolutely, I think you've really got to look at those factors that are going on that might be contributing to uh, inflammation in a child, and uh, and um, whether it's inflammation or not, making those changes that I suggested will have definitely a positive impact on, on child's mood. So, um, Here's a question on the gut milieu or of because you, and, and I know um, I've read as well that more and more attention is being paid to what is the probiotic family in the intestines and you know what is its composition and how does that relate to not just mental health but all kinds of health. So mm -hmm. have there been any studies that have shown that using a probiotic blend of some sort or a prebiotic, uh, like uh, different kinds of fibers, will improve mental health symptoms? Um, there have been um, some studies that have looked at uh, probiotics for mental health um, that are published. I, I, off the top of my head, I can't give you the strains that they use, but uh, there's been a couple of studies that have been done. Uh, I think we're still early days to try to to be definitive in, in understanding of which probiotic strains there are. But, um, but uh, there's probably some companies out there that have a, a mix of probiotics. I, I would probably initially just kind of look at a general strain, a general good high quality probiotic first um, uh, and, and go with that rather than trying to choose a mental health or mood lifting strain of probiotics yet. I don't think we're, we're at that stage yet. Okay. Also, uh, here's another one just came in. Um, how long do you think a person should take the supplements you recommend before expecting results? Um, it's quite interesting, actually. With the, the studies that I've um, done, basically what I found, I had kind of, in my studies, I've recruited real people. So, And what I mean by that is that um, a lot of studies will kind of exclude people who have got this condition or got this symptom, and they're, they're really nice, kind of healthy um, people, but they're not necessarily representative of the, of the population. So I had really kind of people with a whole bunch of um, life factors and, and, and long-term depression and so forth that I recruited for my study. And what I found was that um, uh, that in the first four weeks, there's not really a lot of difference between the placebo and the um, and the curcumin or saffron, for example. Um, but after the four, first four weeks, that's when the improvement started occurring. So I'm thinking at least four weeks. Um, for it to start taking effect, and I'd probably go for at least three months um, uh, because we really want to reduce inflammation, we want to heal the body, uh, and that's going to take some time. So I would go for for at least three months on the supplements. And not saying that mood won't improve initially straight away for some people, but I, I would give it a good three months. Mm -hmm. um, here's an interesting question. They're saying that uh, have there been studies showing that drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen alleviate depression, even though they have bad side effects? Yep. Um, there, well, there's, there's been studies showing that um, it, it, was, it wasn't particularly ibuprofen, but it was a COX-2 inhibitor, uh, uh, I think it was, um, that they used. And yes, it did have a very positive effect on mood. Um, so that's what led me to go, okay, wow, this is exciting stuff, but I don't want to use a, an anti-inflammatory drug, and that's why I decided to choose curcumin as 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 the uh, treatment rather than a drug. So yeah, there has been. Mm -hmm. um, boy, we're jumping all over the board here with the questions. Here's one on mm -hmm. saffron. Which prior yep. to listening to you and understanding the use of saffron for depression, I had always used as just a wonderful, wonderful spice. But mm -hmm. it says, uh, are there saffron supplements available? Are there different kinds of saffron? Is there a specific kind of saffron that works for depression? Uh, I think you um, what they're asking. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the saffron. I mean, I think if you're taking it for a mood, uh, for, for depression, for example, it's probably best taking it as a supplement. That way you can regulate the dosage. Um, and there are saffron, saffron supplements on the market. And the dosage is 15 milligrams 
twice a day, uh, which is, becomes, it's not a lot that you actually need to take, um, so it becomes quite cost effective because saffron, people freak out when I say saffron because they know it's one of the most expensive spices in the world, or is the most expensive spice in the world. So, um, so yeah, 15 milligrams twice a day as a supplement form. Uh, generally, kind of the people generally use a stigma um, from the saffron, but uh, even some of the research has shown that the petals been affected. But I think I'll still kind of stick with the stigma first. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, it looks like I'm looking here to see if we have any more questions coming in. I'm checking both boxes because uh, it might be in either place. Okay, I I've think. got one here actually. Oh, do you um, have one that came yeah, to you? Yeah, I've got a couple here actually. Uh, oh. um, stopped taking Zoloft about two weeks ago. I want to treat my anxiety and slight depression naturally. I have anxiety and extreme fatigue. I'm storing on my way to my belly. Is that normal for me? Uh, don't sleep well. I mean, sleep, sleep is really, um, if you want to put on weight, um, don't sleep. So I think um, really uh, if you're going off your medication you really need to work on good sleep hygiene um, and really look at some of the recommendations around sleep and improving sleep and also taking um, uh, um, you know natural sleep kind of promoting supplements out there your magnesium uh, your valerian your your um, glycine there's a whole bunch of different uh, ones available um, for sleep um, is there a preferred form of magnesium Steer away from the magnesium oxide because magnesium oxide is uh, poorly absorbed in the body. So I would try to steer away from that. Uh, they're the two I've got. Yep. Well, those are the two you received. I've heard a lot of good things about magnesium glycinate. That's magnesium that's bound to amino yep. acids for better absorption. It's made by, I think the raw material is made by a company called Albion that has a patented what they call Trax system, the real amino yep. acid chelate system yeah. for uh, improved absorption. And in addition to that, I mean, that would that's certainly a good, uh, will absorb form. And some of the research actually, there's a few studies now showing that glycine in particular um, is uh, is good for sleep, really helps um, sleep. So you, you've got the double whammy there, you've got the magnesium oh. plus the, it being bound to the glycine, which I think is a really good combination. Excellent point. Um, here's one that just came in. Um, are you, do you have any re preliminary results from your trial on children with uh, ADHD that you can share? Yeah. Um, still getting in all the data, um, so it's it's looking okay. Um, but yeah, I'm still yeah I still need to get more more information or more more data in for for that study. The depression. I've got another study looking at depression. Um, and curcumin, and that one's looking very promising. So I'd, uh, I'd say there'll be positive results from that one. But the ADHD one, um, yeah, I'm not sure yet. So unfortunately, I can't give a, an answer yet. Uh, here's a question about dosage, um, asking about your trial on depression. If I recall correctly, wasn't that one capsule twice daily of BCM95 curcumin? Yeah, so um, we use 500 milligrams of BCM twice a day. Um, I'm also looking at, uh, in the current study, 250 milligrams um, twice a day. But at the moment, I'll stick with just the, uh, uh, you know, around about the 500 twice a day, or something around there. You can, you know, you can have 750 milligrams if you want twice a day too. So it really depends. But I'd probably try to reg um, monitor it um, or have it twice a day rather than once to just continue with the anti-inflammatory effects throughout the whole day. Excellent. All right. Did any more questions come your way? I just want to make a uh, quick survey of, of... Go ahead. Uh, what do you think of combining supplements with antidepressants like fluoxetine? Um, then, I mean, I think I think that would be uh, really interesting. Saffron uh, in, conjunction to, uh, in conjunction with uh, antidepressants, there was a study showing that that had benefits. Um, I, th I think that the others would, but I, there's no research kind of support that yet. But I, th I mean, ultimately, um, I think you know it's it's a combination of all that you know that that last kind of picture where where all the arrows continues to build up. And off, you know, I, obviously this is just the natural treatments, but you know, it could be medications is in there too. So so certainly supplements in conjunction with um, 
uh, antidepressants could be useful. You just need to make sure that it's not the supplements that contraindicated with antidepressants. For example, St. John's wort, you can't have that with an antidepressant together. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Well, we really appreciate you speaking to us all the way from Australia and helping us understand your research and some of the factors that uh, can be used to naturally help alleviate both depression and anxiety. I hope that you'll join us again. I want to share with you we've had several very kind comments in our chat box and in our Q&A box thanking you for doing such a fine presentation. We've also had questions from individuals about, is this recorded? Can they listen again? How can they get more information? Um, it is recorded. It will be available on the Terry Talks Nutrition YouTube channel, so just Terry Talks Nutrition, all one word. It will also be available on the Terry Talks Nutrition website. Just click under Archived Webinars and give us just a day or so to get this uploaded. Uh, but after that, absolutely, this will be available to listen again. Um, so thank you so much for your interest. And thank you, Dr. Lepresti, for joining us today. No problem at all. Um, also, folks, if you have additional questions, feel free to contact us at terrytroxnutrition.com. While you are visiting that website, feel free to sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Uh, we are very careful with your email address. We never sell email addresses, uh, and we promise not to overload you with emails, but we send out a newsletter once a week that talks about innovations and uh, new things to be used for people that are using natural health interventions for a variety of problems. Uh, you can listen to recordings of past seminars on the Terry Talks Nutrition website or on YouTube. And on the Terry Talks Nutrition website, you can also submit your own questions about health and nutrition to Terry. Uh, I want to also make sure that I uh, announce the next upcoming educational event. So on April 28th, we are going to have Dr. Ajay Cole, who is the head of epigenetics and gastrointestinal cancer research at Baylor University, who's going to be talking about curcumin and colon cancer, the science and the successes. I think that that is a not-to-miss webinar. He always does a fine job, and he is so heavily involved in research in this area that every time we talk with him, there are new innovations to report. Also, on May 18th, a Focus on Fats, Learn to Eat Like Terry, and that's going to be presented by Terry Limerand himself. That will be on May 18th at 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. Well, thank you, everyone, who's taken time to attend today. We really appreciate your interest in natural health. If we can be of any further service, please do contact us at terrytalksnutrition.com, and I hope you'll join us for another upcoming educational event. Our thanks again to Dr. Lepresti, and until we all meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.